Welcome. Okay, now we're going to talk about abdominal trauma. So our first slide. Actually, it's okay. Oh, sorry, I'm like, this slide is on. Okay, so 13 to 15 percent of all trauma deaths are leading to abdominal trauma. Third leading cause of death of all of our age groups. Rarely there's a single organ involved. Um, blunt abdominal trauma is very challenging to diagnose and penetrating trauma, trauma is associated with um, lower mortality and usually more obvious injuries. Penetrating stab wounds, like we had one last night with a box cutter. <laughs> um, low velocity uh, damage depends on the degree of penetration and possible sources of bacteria. And this is always important too, like when we get the MITV report, we ask what object was used, what size is the object. We, we like to get that information to know and then where it is on the body, it kind of helps us. So. Gunshot wounds, higher velocity is considered type of weapon and bullet and possible, possibly ricocheting um, and projectiles. Just real quick, I had one case where he was driving and somebody came up to his car window and shot him like this. It bounced off the baseboard. The bullet entered here, but it ended up in the liver. And you, and you knew that right away, but we didn't discover that until we got to the operating room because he was, his pul he had a low blood pressure, everything like that. But they ricochet, depending on, they can ricochet anywhere up. You may think it's just in the thigh, but it's not. So, blunt trauma. Um, motor vehicle crashes, motorcycle crashes, pedestrian versus auto, assaults and falls. Uh, mechanical injury energy forces impact in injury. Obviously you have to worry about the velocity of how you always, the same thing with the MITV report, we always ask how fast was it? Surface street, freeway street, is as much information as we can get. So, okay, so this is, uh, we, uh, the assessment part of looking at the abdomen. Subjective, assess and reassess pain. So they go through their primary survey and they're palpating the belly, well the secondary, they're palpating the belly and to see where the pain is exactly. Um, they inspect the appearance of the abdomen. It's very important you, when they see, it may be soft or flat, but if you've got an abdominal injury, you're gonna see rigid and severe pain once they press on a certain part of the belly, obviously. Um, auscultate to see if there's um, bowel sounds present in all four um, quadrants. They use percussion um, to panic over air filled spaces and dull over the solid organs. Um, palpation is really, I think it's key. Most of the time we see when they're doing the, they do the survey in the trauma room and palpation, they can really significantly see where the, it is, the source. Um, and then you're always going to see guarding where they come to try and pull your hand off of there. Diagnostic studies. So, um, in the trauma room, we use, we always say abdominal ultrasound, we're saying fast. So what we're doing is actually um, doing five areas when we look at it. We're looking at, they look at the um, kidney, the spleen, the heart, the bladder, and the intestine, or the, the bladder, uh, I'm forgetting a part, five areas that they're looking at, and the part of the cardiac window. So they're going through in the trauma room and looking at those views to see if there's any blood in those areas. So when we tell you abdominal or fast was negative, they've checked out the heart, the spleen, the liver, the bladder, all those different areas to make sure there's no blood pooling there. Um, DPL is a peritoneal lavage, is what they use in the trauma room to, dis to discover whether or not there's blood in that cavity. For instance, like with the box cutter incident last night, that a DPL, first they look at the wound and they look and explore to see how deep the wound is. If it's gone past the fascia, then they're going to do um, the peritoneal lavage. And that's where they actually do it all sterilely, put a tube in there, they're, they infuse like half a liter of, or almost down to 200 cc's of a liter bag into the belly and drain it out. And then they'll send that sample off for study if it's really inconclusive to see how, what the red blood cell count is. Sometimes it's just obviously frank and then you're going right to the operating room. Um, if like the fast is positive, we usually do uh, the contrast. So we'll do uh, CT abdomen with contrast. And this gives us more information about, you know, where the bleeding is. And most of the time spleen or liver will see type of fracture, uh, kind of um, liver laceration or splenic lack they have. Um, angiogram dilodes um, that we use, we have to be very, cautious, obviously for any type of CT dilodes, um, the age of the patient, impaired renal function, so it's really important to get chemistries, 
And we have to consider that when we're doing, because a lot of our patients don't automatically get chemistry. So we have to consider that if we're going to be doing that on, we try and get a chemistry on them to see what their BUN and creatinine is. If they're diabetic, um, and then if, they're, if they require diuresis. And it also, I think the next slide talks about allergies too. If you have allergies to dye load, and it's very important, they, they probably won't risk it. If they have to, they do like a bicarb infusion prior to you getting a dye load. Like, it's a bicarb um, NS infusion that uh, the, ra the radiology department has already pre-formatted orders for. The diaphragm injuries, um, they're usually missed, um, may present after um, you have positive pressure. So you have somebody in the, in the ICU for a long time that's getting APRV or pressure type ventilation or higher PEEP. You're gonna see um, that they, they have a diaphragm injury that's gonna come up later. Um, bowel sounds in the chest. You don't ever want to hear bowel sounds in the chest. That means, what does that mean? If the bowel sounds are in the chest? There's, yeah, there's a diaphragm injury and the bowels are coming up through there. That's, it's a very bad sign and you want to call right away. <laughs> um, gastric injuries, enzymatic autolysis. So this sometimes usually has to do with pancreatic injuries where you have a higher um, acid, you know, obviously your uh, gastrointestinal fluids are more acidic and it's going to be friable to the tissues. So if you have that um, process going on, it's almost like a burn inside your tissues. And that's very bad as well. Um, NG tube. You're going to assess drainage. Um, it's for decompression and it's, it, usually you don't manipulate too much with this at all. Um, nutrition and H2 blockers are always important. It's part of our assessment. And, and then suture lines are always very delicate. We had a case just the other day where the suture lines didn't hold and he was sent down to the unit right away and went to surgery that night because out of his ostomy tube was frank blood and he just had gastric surgery. So that's obviously an obvious sign and unfortunately we got, you know, the nurse that was on the floor go, oh, just watch it, just watch it. And his crit went from 42 to 18. So, no. <laughs> so if you Liver injuries. Um, grade one through uh, grade, uh, this says six, I thought it was grade five, but um, physical exam, document by quadrant. Uh, watch serial uh, hemo hem hemoglobins and hematocrits, PT, PTT, and liver enzymes, because you're going to, like if they haven't ordered it, try and rem remind them to order it. I don't see why they wouldn't order it with a liver injury, but you will, um, it's very important to watch the serial crits, and then also INRs and things like that, because liver injuries can progress to a nightmare if, they, if they're not watched. Um, Evaluate for hemodynamic stability. If they are losing blood, you're going to see the same signs, tachycardia, hypo, you know, their blood pressure is going to drop. Liver injury. Grade one is lacerations is less than a centimeter uh, deep. It's subscapular hematoma, one centimeter in diameter, like an abrasion to the liver. Grade two, lacerations are one to three centimeters deep. Subscapular or central hematoma, one to three centimeters deep. And then grade three lacerations, three to 10 centimeters deep, subscapular, central hematoma, it's three to 10 centimeters deep. Usually if they're in grade three or grade four, you're gonna see them in the ICU. Um, grade four laceration is greater than 10. And it, again, the subscapular or central hematoma less, in less than 10 centimeter deep. And then you might see some where they, the liver is very macerated and that you see these, I've seen these with motorcycle accidents, things like that where it's totally, they have to go right to the OR and part of that liver is mush, a section of it. And devascularization happens. Um, and then grade five, there's the most of the tissue, by lower the, tissue maceration and devascularization. So they have to do some sort of effort to save a portion of the liver. You all know we can't live without a liver. So, um, so they're showing pictures here. Um, if you look at this one, it's on to the left. It's not as bad an abrasion. If you see over here where the, the cracks are, that's much worse. So, and they're segmented. Splenic injuries are probably the most common that we see. Um, and they're the most common to go bad on you. The patient looks fine. I've had this happen to me twice. They look fine, they're talking to you, and suddenly you're into like a, 
a cold sweat, hypotension, tachycardia, their splenic rupture right in front of your eyes. So that's obviously an OR emergency that you have to get to. Most common um, abdominal organ injury, very vascular, assess hemodynamics and crit. Um, it's vulnerable to injury with rib fractures because it's so close in proximity to ribs 7 through 10. I'm showing you a picture of the spleen next to the stomach there. Pancreatic injury. Um, this is usually a penetrating injury. Rupture can tear ductal systems and allow um, leakage and autodigestive auto state. Um, assess pain and patient's response to meds because you're going to find this, this is probably the most painful injury. Uh, pancreatic injuries are very painful. Um, susceptible to ARDS and DIC. And once they go into ARDS, it's very difficult we, um, with pancreatic injuries. We've got to do a lot of different tricks to get them to oxygenate. And this is usually when they go down to the ICU. And disseminated idiopathic coagulopathy. So you have to send out all your coag labs, the DIC panel. And that, again, gets very tricky when they get into that. And pancreatic injuries can occur late. Like this, it don't occur but from 24 to so you can most likely see them 48 actually. Bowel injury. Um, method of injury. So uh, rapid D cell and seat belts. We had a case the other week where the seat belt, he had an muffling with the left went off a 70 foot embankment. So he had it there. Um, complications result, um, you're going to have sepsis, obviously, most likely from the bowel rupturing and then you're going to deal with signs and complications of sepsis where you had the gut leaking into the cavity. Um, abdominal compartment syndrome. So compartment syndrome is where the muscles are just squeezing the organs so tight that they don't get any perfusion. So your, your signs of this are going to be decreased urine output because of the poor perfusion. Um, we do what well, we do bladder pressures in the ICU. So we actually um, will use instill uh, 30 cc's into the bladder, a device to measure like a uh, uh, CVP waveform. But we look at that to see what the pressures are. If they're greater than 20, then we have signs of, and we usually track this. If we're in the ICU, we'll, um, the doctors will be wanting to track this to see what his abdominal pressure is. And greater than 20, or they may say 25, is showing signs that he's doing increasing compartment syndrome. It can do a lot of things. Decrease your cardiac output, cause hypotension, decrease tidal, uh, tidal volume, and poor compliance with the ventilator, increase um, PIP that we're gonna see on the ventilator. So all those pressures are gonna increase. And distension, rigidity is a late sign, and you're, it's very difficult to get back. Um, so they're showing you here abdominal car compartment syndrome as well as in focus. Um, they're just showing you different areas like the thorax, the abdomen, and the muscles in the thighs. You can see compartment syndrome in the abdomen. It can be very rigid. We've, I, has anybody, have you guys seen it in tissues like in extremities? It's, you can feel it right away. If you feel it, it's like it's hard as a rock. Not what it's supposed to be. So the blood pressure is going to drop. You're going to have, again, the ventilator. Usually these people are on the ventilator. And it's it's um, very difficult, and they have to leave the abdomen open. So, like we have many, we have a patient right now where the abdomen is left open for a day or two until we can get it uh, go back to close. Abdominal vascular injuries depends on location of the injury. Um, again, you're assessing hemodynamics. Um, blood pressure control is extremely important, so we use everything to keep the blood pressure under control, metropolol, hydrolysis, whatever they have to do to keep that blood pressure within the parameters they want. And assess um, anticoagulant therapy, um, signs and symptoms of complications due to cross clamp time and location. So those are always important times, like if they're repairing something, aortic repair or something else in the admin, and they have cross clamp time on the, um, if you're getting report from the nurse or from the PACU nurse, it's also very crucial to see the time the clamp was on for how long. Because you're going, if it's higher up and it's been on for a long time, you're going to have a lot of issues with vascular on the lower extremities and also the organs. So plan, vascular organs, hemodynamic stability. Um, close monitoring for development of complications or worsening injury. 
um, ensure adequate nutrition. And that can sometimes be really complex, trying to, because um, of the high residuals that, with the digestive system not working. And risk of infection is always high. Pain management is, again, true. Trying to get that under control will help the healing process much better. Um, injury specific. So liver injuries that are non-operative. Um, you're doing, obviously, bed rest, serial CAT scans to keep an eye on how, how it's healing and close monitoring. So you, with liver injuries, depending on what it is, again, you're um, going to assess the abdomen. And again, if it comes across, you're going to see it right in front of your eyes if something happens, they start to bleed. Same thing with losing blood. You know, they're going to be uh, tachycardic, low blood pressure, sweaty, and acting very confused and anxious. Um, liver injuries that have to be operative, um, hepatic resections or repairs, like those grade four liver, um, grade lax. Um, it's always important to warm the blood. We have a blood warmer. Like when we're doing OR recesses that involve the liver or anything, we, the first thing they try to do is put in two big devices, so uh, big cortices. They'll put them in the neck, they'll put them in the, in the femoral. Just so, and we'll use the rapid infusers just to keep the blood products growing. Um, your FFP, platelets, uh, PRBCs, and we do a sequence of how many um, uh, pack our blood cells to platelets to FFP. So if you're going to give, you know, four PRBCs, you're going to make sure you have two FFP and one platelet. So you have to, if you're, you remind them of what you've given so far. I'm talking, I guess, more of an OR recess with a liver injury. And IV access, like I said, is imperative. You have to have major access in order to have good survivability with bad liver injuries and lab values. So you have to keep on top of what your co coags are because if you just keep getting farther and farther out, you're basically just opening the blood and pouring it on the floor. You're not even getting into the patient if they're really high out on their INR. And keeping the patient warm. So you, that's very important and it's, it's sometimes very difficult to achieve, but we have blood warmers and fluid warmers that we use to keep the patient warm. Splenic injuries, operative. Um, so a splenectomy or repairing the, the spleen in a splenography, you can do that. And they've also done that in Angie before. They've used mesh to repair the spleen. So it's also a possibility. Um, <laughs> Non-operative, again, serial crits are so important. Um, watching the CAT scans, they'll repeat the CAT scans. Um, bed rest. And then you also have to think, without the spleen, you need um, the pneumovax and you'll be on antibiotics, those type of things, because the spleen is very important for infection, preventing infection. Bowel injuries, um, you have to keep the NG tube in for um, decompression and, and this can be difficult. Like the case I talked about the other night with the sutures that ruptured, we couldn't get an NG tube down him to save our lives the first 20 minutes when he came down, but we finally got it down. But it's very important. <laughs> Antibiotic coverage is also important. Abdominal compartment syndrome. Pressure relief is needed, obviously. Incisions to um, release the compartment syndrome, and again, the abdomen may be left open. Um, they they do this, you know, with a hand in place, and they leave them paralyzed and sedated in the unit for a few days. And then they also do uh, wound vac closures if they're not able to get it closed and used. The the fascia will be closed, and they use wound vac closures for that. There's always risks with um, abdominal healing that you're going to have fistulas, suture leaks, ischemic bowel, and also kidneys, and then fecal leakage into the abdominal area. And I think we've all, I've seen that once or twice too, where the wound vac starts with fecal coming out and you're just horrified. But again, that is an emergency. You have to let the physician know right away. It's not normal. Um, evaluation. So high level of suspicion with mechanism of injury, diligent assessment and reassessment, intervention, serial labs, um, completed in a timely fashion and, and followed up and communication with concerns and changes. There are two cases I can think of that we missed in the trauma room. We had an elderly lady that we um, took care of and she kept saying, I hate when they say this to you, I think I'm going to die. I feel like I'm going to die. And you're like, no, you're not going to die. You're fine. 
well, we did all the we did all the tests, but she started getting hypotensive, tachycardic, but she's bleeding. Where is she bleeding from? We did the head scan, we did the neck scan, we did the abdominal ultrasound, we did the CAT scan of the abdomen, we did everything. We're freaking out. Turned out when we looked at the CAT scan, the CAT scan had cut her off too high, so it was a lower area bleeding into here that we totally missed. I mean, so we, we we went back to the operating room, but this was a patient that made it up to IMU. <laughs> so it's like. He, you can't always, re you have to keep reviewing and reviewing and trying to figure out if somebody's showing it, it it's happening. Yeah. So keep communicating. Communication is key, I think, for everything. So if you really feel like something's wrong, you, you have, have to let everybody know that something's wrong. You know? And, and then you don't, sometimes you're waiting to get the order for a hematocrit. You got to get it to show that crit went to 40 to 20. It's not good. <laughs> Any questions? No?